Well, hello and welcome everybody uh, to this Freeman Air and Space Institute online event. Um, it's really good to um, be here. Uh, and for those of you who don't know me, my name is Sophie Antrobus. I'm a research fellow here at the Institute. Um, and our event today is on how to create an optimised Air Force. Some of you will know that the Royal Air Force led the establishment of the Global Air Force's climate change collaboration. In fact, the launch event took place at King's, hosted by Freeman, uh, about two and a half years ago now. It's a collaboration of the world's air forces to share ideas and best practice on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and operating more efficiently as fighting forces. The initiatives continue to develop with working groups led by countries from around the globe um, and more than 40 air forces are participating. So I'm delighted to be joined by Roberto Guerrero, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the US Air Force for Operational Energy, whose team are doing some really fascinating work, which is what we're going to learn about today. I know the slides include some contact information for his organisation at the end, and we'll also be putting that in the chat. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome from the Freeman, or to and from the Freeman Air and Space Institute. We hold regular events online and in person on all aspects of air and space power. Um, you can also join our mailing list from the front page of our website, and there'll be some details um, in, in the, in the um, chat function as well there. Um, and if you haven't done so, you can also have a look at some of our recent publications, most recently on one on space defense dependence, one on space deterrence by denial, and even one by myself on an applied history of the RAF's appetite to risk, because uh, there's always time for a bit of self-promotion, isn't there? Uh, do keep an eye on our socials about future events. So we're on LinkedIn and X slash Twitter. Um, uh, uh, and so we hope to see you again at future events. This event will be recorded uh, and we will be putting putting that out on our YouTube um, uh, at some point in the future. It normally takes a few days for that to take place. So in terms of format today, um, Bert, as he's kindly asked me to address him, will speak for around 20 minutes and then we'll turn to Q&A. So please use the Q&A function. You can start putting questions in as soon as you want. Um, I'm sure you're all used to this and um, we've been doing this for some time now, haven't we? Anyway, um, to introduce um, Roberto Guerrero. Um, he's responsible for providing oversight and direction for all matters pertaining to the formulation, review and execution of plans, policies and programmes for the effective and efficient use of the US Air Force's $5 billion, amazing figure, operational energy bill in support of its global mission. Um, Bert first joined the Navy as an aviator in the late 1980s and then trans transferred to the United States Air Force in 2000. He qualified on the E3 AWACS and held assignments in Oklahoma and Okinawa, Japan, where he commanded the 961st Airborne Air Control Squadron. He later served at the Air Force Safety Center as a division chief and concluded his career in the military as the center's vice commander. And during his military service, he served in many operations um, across the globe, flew 24 combat missions over Afghanistan during Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, and a as a command pilot, he has more than 4,100 flight hours under his belt, including 350 combat hours. In the next phase of his career, he joined the civil service, um, serving as deputy chief of Start safety uh, for the US Air Force and executive director Air Force Safety Center in New Mexico. And following that tour, tour of duty, he was director of staff headquarters, Air Force Reserve Command in Georgia. So uh, an impressive CV with both the combat experience and, and a lot of safety experience, which is my area of interest at the moment. Um, I'll hand over now uh, to Bert, um, for about 20 minutes. And as I say, after that, we'll have a good length of time for some Q&A. So please do put your questions in the box. Over to you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Andrew Buss, uh, uh, to you and to the Freeman Air and Space Institute for allowing us to, to talk about things that we're working on. Uh, we really feel strongly that sharing ideas of optimizing um, aviation uh, will make us all stronger in the end. Um, I'm going to ask my uh, exec, Lieutenant Ramos, to go ahead and share the slides, please. There we go. There we are. Okay. Um, so, uh, as as Sophie mentioned, you know, I was. Um, uh, career aviator actually had an aeronautical engineering degree in college, and at some point, I think I saw Top Gun One, 
and decided I wanted to be um, a, an operator initially and did that for 23 years. And, um, you know, as she mentioned, I, I concluded my career at the Air Force Safety Center. And I think that goes to a lot of what our strategy is with respect to how do you optimize aviation? Because from a safety perspective, you look at how to optimize safety. Obviously, you know, combat capability is key to safety. You know, the safest thing you can do is just not fly, right? But you're not gonna be combat capable. So we would look at processes as well as technologies to operate our aircraft more safely, operate our vehicles more safety, safely, you know, think uh, ALOC brakes and, and, and uh, seat belts and, and airbags. Those are all for the occupant uh, to either drive safer or to protect them in, the, uh, in, in a crash. Um, you know, and the, and the flip side is, is that you have to do driver training too, right? So for us, we think a lot about, you know, the process as well as the technologies that will get us to optimize the execution of our mission. <clears throat> Excuse me, next slide. And so just a um, kind of an overview of our mission and vision. Um, you know, the bottom line is, is that we're a Department of Defense, the United States Department of Defense entity. You know, and for the taxpayer, we are looking to uh, optimize and increase combat capability and mitigate operational risk uh, through energy informed solutions and technologies. And, you know, in the long run, we're looking to have an energy optimized Air Force that um, that maximizes our lethality per gallon. And we do that in five different uh, ways. Uh, fuel more fight talks about the improvement of an energy intensity of operations. That's really that squeezing that much more mission out of every drop of gas or energy, you know, whatever energy you might be using. Uh, no fuel, no fight is uh, really key to us, especially in the Pacific of understanding the fuel logistics supply chain. You know, we fought in theaters of recent that are not challenged from a logistics perspective, uh, at least on the aviation side. But, you know, some of our uh, emphasis in the Department of Defense with respect to operational energy really goes back to what um, ground forces were seeing in Iraq and Afghanistan in 2007, 2008 timeframe, where that fuel and water logistics supply chain was really um, threatened. And about a third of our casualties at that time in those theaters uh, were because we were delivering fuel and water and other logistics um, across threatened pathways to uh, forward operating bases that really did not have uh, the right and optimized equipment. So generators that were maybe under a 10% load and no real good water recycling processes and whatnot. And so the Department of Defense started looking at that and then it directed all the services to do the same thing. And that's where we have really taken off since about 2010 when my office was stood up and I got here in 2014, we really tried to look at you know, what the demand is at the tip of the spear and what equipment we are providing and how can we optimize that equipment? What are the processes that we're using and how can we optimize those processes? Uh, goal number three, accelerate to win. We really saw, and we'll talk about this in the future, and I use this example of why my office exists, but we really saw some, you know, to be frank, 19th century, 1800s, 19th century solutions for executing our mission. We were doing, you know, um, complex schedules in at LUD Air Base um, on a, with dry race markers and, and, and magnets, really nothing more than a glorified chalkboard. And that's really not the way we can optimize the way we execute our mission. And obviously, you know, in the commercial industry, Maersk and other logistics companies would never do something like that. So, so we uh, spent some time uh, trying to optimize those types of processes. Data informed decisions. We also saw that we really weren't collecting the data off of our aircraft and in being a, a safety guy and knowing that flight data recorders have um, a wealth of knowledge that will help us operate more safely, they will also help us operate more efficiently and track those, let's say drag reduction or let's say power plant improvements that we've been doing to make sure that they're actually giving us the type of effect that we want. And then engage and inform stakeholders. This is part of it, building an OE culture throughout you know, our allies and partners, uh, as well as within the Air Force, uh, and uh, determining ways to incentivize um, the more optimum execution of our mission. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so just um, 
just as a start off, you know, one of the bigger projects we're working on is uh, this thing called the blend and wing body. We uh, have been flight following this particular technology since um, about 2010. Um, NASA and Boeing and before that McDonnell Douglas were looking at how do we develop more optimum airframes. You know, a tube and wing design, the tube itself is really easy to pressurize. That's why you see cylindrical pressure vessels throughout, you know, um, most uh, pressure type of um, applications. Uh, but for us, uh, that tube really doesn't help you with respect to lift. It just creates drag. And so um, the idea behind the blending wing body, and it's not, um, you may look at it and say, hey, it looks like, like a flying wing, but it's really not a flying wing because the idea is, is that that whole internal area is is pressurized and it really expands the amount of storage that you can have on the order of um we think at four thousand miles you could probably air refuel about seven f-35s as compared to one right now with our kc-46 and our uh, uh kc-135 and um you know the same type of applications in cargo can ensure that we have much greater reach and combat capability in uh, theaters that will be challenged such in the, uh, like in the Pacific. Uh, so we're in the process of doing this public private partnership because the airlines are also interested in having something that can carry a lot more passengers with a lot lower fuel burn. We think on the order of just aerodynamics alone, about a 30% increase in efficiency. And that's big for the airlines because they spend a lot of money in gas. Um, and so this public private partnership might be, um, you know, the, the project itself is kind of similar to the 707, uh, Boeing 707 development, which was really started by the Dash 80, which was the precursor to the Air Force buying uh, aerial tankers, the KC-135 Alpha models, and then the commercial airlines like uh, Wand Trip and Pan Am buying 707s. Um, we want to get something airborne, demonstrate the capabilities, and we think that will result in a, a big demand, and it provides us uh, um, competition that right now um, doesn't really exist with a duopoly of large aircraft manufacturers, meaning Boeing and Airbus. So we'd like to see more competition. This is one way uh, to do it. And we've done this in similar applications in the Air Force, like uh, Agility Prime, where we put a little bit of money in and uh, we've developed several companies, um, Joby, Beta, Archer, that are trying to expand urban air mobility. Next slide, please. Um, part of uh, what we discovered is that crews themselves, like the way where our finances are structured, the way our um, uh, uh, the, the Air Force uh, pays for fuel, is that it's a centralized account. That centralized account tells wing commanders and squadron commanders like me, just fly out your flying hour program and we'll pay the gas bill. Well, we realized uh, when we started looking at locations like in the B-52 and uh, the C-17 and the C-5 that um, sometimes operations and maintenance would agree upon a ramp load that would ensure that any time any crew needs to go to any aircraft, they can conduct their mission, but it really wasn't efficient. Uh, we were carrying a lot of extra fuel. And in some cases, that carrying of extra fuel that you weren't going to burn was resulting in, in additional maintenance because the aircraft were heavier you were replacing your tires and your brakes and your struts a lot more. As a matter of fact, in the, in the, um, the B-52 community, we calculated uh, per year about a 7,000 maintenance man hours uh, addition just to replace parts that were breaking down because they were landing so heavier, so much heavier than they really needed to be uh, on the order of about 30,000 pounds heavier than they needed to be. So we started this program. And part of it is, is that wing commanders and squadron commanders now benefit from um, the, you know, the, the savings. In other words, we go back and say, look, we'd like you to look at these best practices that we've already developed through our research of the way you fly C-17 missions and C-5 missions. And it's helpful to have pilots and air crew on our staff, as well as aeronautical engineers to be able to, to show the, um, the validity of these procedures. And some of these pilots are reservists, so uh, which means that they work for us part-time and they work for the airlines part-time. So they see what the airlines are doing and they're trying to bring some of that efficiency and, and effectiveness back uh, to the Air Force. What we see with the, with this Mission Execution Excellence Program is that there, in the past, wasn't an incentive for wing commanders and squadron commanders to 
to ask their crews to look differently at the way they execute the mission. Now that they are, we give them a certain amount, percentage back from the savings that we approve for that year. And then the rest of it goes back into other mission priorities. Instead of being burnt out the tailpipes of our aircraft, that money is actually used towards something uh, tangible. And then the money that we're giving to the wings, they have the ability to use it for crew um, enhancements for equipment, maintenance enhancement for equipment, or other things that are just quality of life that in the past they haven't had the money for. Like I'll tell you that most wing commanders in the Air Force, like a base somewhere, that wing commander has maybe twenty-five dollars to $50,000 a year for discretionary funds to do what he wants to do. The rest of it's pretty much tied up. So when we came to them and said, hey, we'll give you somewhere above $250,000 per year if you participate in this program, because we think that's the amount of savings that we'll realize the, they, they adopted it instantly. And you can see we went from uh, one location or excuse me, a couple locations and saving about a million gallons in the first year to about four million gallons in the second year. And um, that was way more than we were actually getting out of awards, but it was something that they were um, enthusiastic. So this idea behind, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, but this idea behind providing an incentive uh, is really, uh, we think, effective in getting crews and their leadership to say, yep, I'll do it a little differently because it results in me uh, getting something in return that'll help me either execute the mission or make my quality of life better. Next slide, please. So we're also doing some work just on um, looking at technologies in aerodynamics that in the past we've tested but again, um, it, was, it was difficult to translate those savings that we would receive in fuel back to the, um, to the, the, the sustainment folks who were working on it. It's really tough when you, when you approach uh, an organization and say, hey, I know you're having trouble keeping your aircraft airborne because of various different maintenance actions, but we'd like to add one more thing to complicate your life. Um, and uh, that's gonna save us fuel and, um, and we'll talk about how I get that money back to you. We really wanted to focus in on initially really easy efforts that are very low cost, that are that are almost invisible to maintenance folks. And uh, that's why we started with the uh, microbanes. C-17s and the C-130s really are um, pretty good candidates for this program. And really what it does, much like, you know, winglets reduce vortices off the wingtip, uh, especially those aircraft that have a large ramp um, and a large upsweep on the tail, they, um, they create a lot of aft body vortices that these help mitigate. And so in this case, you can see a very, very small cost for us on the order of, we think about three to $6 million per year, or excuse me, one time, three to $6 million for a one-time cost to, to retrofit all of our um 222 C-17s, which, you know, is, you know, roughly about six to, I'm trying to think what the number was, six to 10 million per uh, aircraft plus maintenance costs. And that, and that um, so very, very low, co low cost for the entire fleet. And we'll return it back in fuel savings within the first year. And I'll tell you that that $5 billion, you know, little ones and two percents off that $5 billion turns out to be a pretty big number. And actually, our numbers have gone up a little bit because of the cost of price, so we're closer to seven billion. About the about the uh, fuel burn of a, a small airline like um, Southwest Airlines here in the United States, about half of what American and United burn per year. But it's still a big number, and repurposing that money back to mission has really been a, a lot of our success. So in this case, about a one percent change in the C-130, uh, we think closer to three to five percent. Um, we've already seen some airlines adopting this in the United States where they realize that 1% uh, for them, and especially the low cost of implementation, has, uh, has you know, attracted them to implementing this technology. Next slide. <clears throat> Similarly, we we're looking at this type of um, application on uh, the C-130 aircraft. And there's a company called Microtow in Australia that has this... Um, uh, is basically tape application. It's a large, you know, um, adherable applique on certain areas of the aircraft. And those uh, really microscopic riblets, you know, very, very small uh, changes to the surface of the aircraft are also uh, drag reduction um, and, and enhancing. And so we're going to go down the path over the next year 
to do what we're doing in the C-17 right now, which is we're flying 10 aircraft for serviceability just to make sure that nothing uh, causes these microbeans to come off the aircraft or, um, you know, just for damage um, tolerance and whatnot. We're going to do that. Uh, eight aircraft, eight U.S. aircraft, two Canadian aircraft. We're going to uh, do that serviceability over the next year. While in the C-130, we're actually going to do the flight testing that we just finished with the C-17 on these technologies and looking to do serviceability testing after that. I'll, I'll, I'll note that um, in the C-130, there's a commercial a variant of the C-130 that this company called Linden Air Cargo that operates in Alaska and other cold environments. They've been using this microwave solution that the Air Force tested 10 years ago. They've been using it for the past uh, six or seven years. They've accumulated about 25,000 hours on their 10 aircraft, have never had any issues, have never had one of these things come off, um, have never had one of these things damaged. They've kind of forgotten about it, but uh, they, other than the fact that they know it gets them about 3% per year in fuel savings, and the U.S. Coast Guard did the same thing, also saw about 3% in fuel savings. And so uh, we think this is a pretty good application going forward. Next slide. Um, uh, similarly, you know, we've looked at how we wash engines um, and how we coat engine blades. And um, we found pretty good success, especially in the, in the CV-22. We tried um, auditing how they wash their engines. We discovered that there were some issues with the, the method that had been provided by the OEM, um, the original you know, uh, equipment manufacturer on how to wash those engines because they were just washing the hot section of the engine. They weren't washing the whole engine. As we all know, you know, in certain environments, the whole section of the engine is gonna get contaminated. It's like compressor blades and turbine blades. And so if you can figure out a way to wash the whole engine as opposed to just the hot section, what advantage would that give to you? You know, washing the hot section on a CD22 was difficult because they would have it in this, you know, um, props up uh, uh, configuration. And then they would actually have to take off cowlings and insert two, um, two hoses that squirted uh, detergent into the hot section on, uh, on each engine. And that whole cowling removal process was really onerous. And uh, this company came to us and said, we have this way to squirt. Uh, water that has a little bit of detergent in it, but if you mix it with enough compressed air, it'll expand. And uh, the big question was, well, does it expand enough to get to the entire engine? Because we really want to wash the hot section. And the first couple of tests, they opened up the ports for the hot section and the foams that uh, this thing was bringing in the front of the aircraft were coming out that. So they were like, yep, it's working. It's getting the whole engine. And then let's take a look at what it does. And uh, we saw not only an increase in um, the uh, engine performance, um, uh, you know, roughly about a 5% more power on average per engine. And, and the legacy system really didn't work that well. As a matter of fact, about two thirds of the engine washes saw no change to the legacy way of doing it. Whereas this one saw an immediately an increase in engine performance, an increase in engine life. And then most, most importantly, and this goes back to that incentive piece, most importantly, our maintenance folks said, I don't have to remove those cowlings anymore. I don't need like several people for this job. I can do it with uh, one person motor in the engine, one person on the truck. So that really reduced maintenance man hours. And for them, that's what got them. They said, yep, absolutely. We're getting more um, maintenance man hours on other stuff. And consequently, that re uh, resulted in them getting the aircraft availability up on all their aircraft, which was a great thing. And in this case, it reduced engine changes on uh, the, the CB-22 by about half. So now we're also testing this same uh, methodology on other aircraft to include the C-130 and the KC-135 because we think um, it'll help in all those um, applications. Maybe not as much as it did in the CV-22, especially from a maintenance manpower perspective. But again, you know, 0.5% uh, of a you know, $750 million uh, fuel bill per year in the KC-135 is nothing to sneeze at. And if it increases... Uh, maintenance availability for other stuff that we get the adoption there. Um, the second thing we're looking at, and this a lot of this strategy was developed with us and Delta Tech Ops, uh, the folks out in Atlanta who you know service all the Delta Airlines engines and, um, and airframes, was um, the strategy behind look at how you wash it and look at how you coat it. So we've been working with this company called MDS Technologies on their black cold coating, which uh, appears to do a much better job of coating the compressor blades 
you know, at about the 18 month point, you'll see traditional compressor blades start to wear down where the black gold, uh, black gold coated blades will not. And that results in the engine just running that much more efficiently and the compressor working that much better for longer periods of time. Next slide. Um, so some of that money that we were saving in fuel, um, we have a method now to, to recoup that money. And we've been using that money to get after other things that we think make a lot of sense for the Air Force. And this is one of those things. How do we get um, crews that maybe don't have access to an aircraft like 24-7? And because they're doing the mission, how do we get those crews familiarized with the aircraft? How do we get uh, the maintainers, the air crew, the pilots familiarized with the walk around procedures, things that they will find wrong? And this is where we, we've been working with this one company to digitize the interior and exterior of most of our bigger aircraft and, uh, and then providing these low cost headsets to those folks who are awaiting training. And now they're stepping into training and, and they know the aircraft now. They know it much better than they would have otherwise. And that results in a much quicker uh, ability to get them up on step and qualified to perform maintenance or perform operations in the aircraft, as well as we think it's really good for a, I don't have to have a training asset on the flight line, you know, when that training asset could be used airborne to get air crew trained. So that, that, um, that dual piece has really resulted in, in uh, some pretty good adoption from the Air Mobility Command that, you know, is the, the beneficiary of this training funds. Next slide. So this is uh, going back to that, that, uh, that jet at the top of the screen there, uh, that's, he's at LUD Air Base. Um, if you look behind him, you can, might be able to see it, but there's actually that whiteboard that they were using until 2017. So from 9-11, 2001 to 2017, we were using dry erase markers, magnets uh, on whiteboards to schedule a 250 receiver, 50 tanker schedule per day. Um, and uh, it turns out Eric Schmidt from Google was part of what they call a defense innovation board here in the States. And he was visiting different places to look at the software we were using. And he saw that and he goes, you got to be kidding me. And so um, we initially started with this process of looking at that, um, that particular task that was taking eight to 12 hours. And how do we reduce the timeline on it and increase the efficiency on it? We've got about a 4% improvement in efficiency and about um, you know, a, a pretty large reduction, about 66% reduction in manpower because instead of eight to 12 hours to get that done, and by the way, their shift was eight to 12 hours, two to four hours, um, they actually did a side-by-side -side where folks were still working the whiteboard. The other folks were working the electronic whiteboard after uh, it was supposed to be a nine month test after four months, the folks working the whiteboard were like, yeah, we don't want to do this anymore. We want to do what you're doing because you're doing it more efficiently. And now it's two to four hours. So I can actually go eat lunch. I can actually go work out while I'm deployed. Um, again, that's an incentive that they saw. And what we saw was that's great, but that's kind of like paper map to the crappy GPS I have in my Highlander, Toyota Highlander, right? Where it's 10 years old, 12 years old. I want Google Maps or Waze or something that's a lot more effective. So we added on this thing called Pythagoras, where it runs through an algorithm for them. Um, and it doesn't take over the task, but it makes that task a lot easier because it'll give them suggestions on a way to maximize capability of that schedule and real time because the, the turnaround time now is like two to four minutes of providing a solution. Now you get this idea where um, if you're actually in combat, you can iterate both um, you know, tanker delivery or munitions delivery or other things, uh, logistics delivery of, of, of stuff, you can iterate that type of work much quicker than you could in the past. So the thought process is, it, and it went from about that 4% that initially got to like uh, 10 to 20% better. So a, a huge savings in fuel on the order of about 200,000 gallons of fuel saved uh, per week in that one location, which when you start adding up the numbers, that's a lot of money being saved and a great payback. So we were looking at, okay, how does that process also help for uh, allocating our aircraft in locations or uh, scheduling our air crew or optimizing our cargo? So these are some estimates of what we think we will be able to save in all these different areas. Um, uh, but you know, just not only are we saving in fuel and greenhouse gas emissions, which are second and third order effects of really what we're trying to do is maximize combat, cap combat capability. We think that provides 
or for us a much better, uh, much better solution for the 21st century fight. Next, next slide. Taking a little longer, so I'm going to kind of go through these latest ones. Um, C2D2 and the idea of doing better communications we think is really important for us. So we've in, uh, put some investments in to work that's already existing that um, helps uh, 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 transmit, uh, securely transmit data from aircraft to the planners back, you know, at wherever it might be, either Pearl Harbor or, you know, Hickam Air Force Base uh, for the air, uh, air mobility, you know, center there or all the way back to Scott Air Force Base, as well as there are other things that we saw that if you like sync up um, uh, the ability to text. So our crews now, instead of walking to base ops and getting a fax from the guys at Scott Air Force Base on what their mission plan is, they receive it on their iPad and uh, it has all their paperwork in it. And it gives them the ability to ask questions from the crews back at home about optimizing that schedule. And then what we also realize is that ability to, to communicate and to have some kind of uh, natural language processing to, to uh, track those communications also would help bubble up problems in certain areas that uh, hadn't been identified, um, like delays um, in aircraft delivery of parts or um, complications with fuel systems in certain locations. Now the generals can actually see the conversation get a roll up of the things that are going on and maybe act quicker to, to fix problems. Next slide. And then, you know, for us, it's really important to kind of ingest the data, understand what it's telling us and help us make sure that we're putting our money against those programs that make the most sense. So we, uh, you know, again, from this safety perspective, what we've done is we've been able to tap into the data that was being collected on aircraft that was being deposited at the Air Force Safety Center pull it into the OSD uh, data lake, and now we're able to go, uh, we'll get to the point here in the next couple months where we'll be monitoring those engine washes and being able to provide back to the maintenance folks when the next engine wash is due um, based off of the performance of the engine. We think that's really, um, we're just at the cutting edge of that, but we think that's immensely valuable for us to select the right aircraft for the right mission because we know how it's behaving and we know what part's gonna break next or we have a good idea what part's going to break next because we're tracking the data and we're tracking the health of the, of the asset. Next slide. And then this gets back to something that's unique to the United States, but but there's no reason why it couldn't be uh, translated to other countries and the way they manage their money. But, you know, what we did is we talked to the Senate Armed Services and the House Armed Services Committee because they provide oversight to us and they, they basically are the ones that do the final stamp on uh, what our budget will look like. And we told them, hey, you know, every year we scramble, our fiscal year goes from October 1 to September 30th. Every year we scramble to make sure we're spending all of our, what we call operations and maintenance money, which a lot of that is fuel. We're, we're trying to make sure we spend that all and there's really no incentive not to spend it. So we typically end up doing not so efficient things at the end of the year um, that will spend that money because we know it, it goes away on the 1st of October. And if you can help us with, um, funding these efficiency initiatives, then perhaps um, you will see a bigger amount of savings at the end of the year. And if you will let us take some of those savings and reinvest it by allowing that, that those funds that are typically have a life of one year, maybe one extra year, then we'll, we'll um, you know, stop relying on you to provide us funds every year in the budget because we will have this, you know, replenishment of savings every year that we could put back into mission. And that's what they agreed to do. So some of that money that I talked about for ARVR training, we actually recouped it and put it back into mission. And this year, we think we're gonna get roughly about $36 million. Um, and then next year, it'll probably be closer to 50. And the year after, probably closer to 75. We'll get into the hundreds of millions. And really, we, we think Congress might say, wait, 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 because I don't think they realized how big of an opportunity this is. But for us, you know, our strategy is 5% reduction in, um, in, in fuel burn over the next five years and 7.5% over the next um, 10 years. And that's in the hundreds of millions. And we think we can at least use some of that to pump back in. We're, we're roughly seeing about a 1% change in efficiency right now on that five to $7 billion bill per year. So that's 50 to $70 million per year that we are able to recoup. And we think um, that will result in this incentivization with folks like 
um, you know, the state sustainment folks who are initially like, hey, wait a minute, you know, I, I, I've already got challenges with this aircraft. Um, can, you know, I, I can't take any more work. That will allow us to provide the money and manpower to maybe get after things that they want to do that we want to do too, like conformal antennas or additional engine efficiency savings that are resulting in them having aircraft that are down because the engines are broken. Okay, next slide. So, you know, just in closing, we recognize, and the reason that you don't see a lot of, a, like, let's say, electrification of aircraft in this discussion is that, you know, we fly big aircraft long distances, and electrification really isn't, um, we think, the first thing that we're going to go after, because we think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, what we use in the United States to say low-hanging fruit, in uh, just our processes and our technologies, getting them caught up to the 21st century. Um, and, and we think that by going after that, we will additional, we'll build additional disciples within the Air Force that want to help us because they know that there's these funds that they can recoup to get after the problems that they have that overlap with the problems that we have. So that's, that's my presentation and uh, standing by for questions.